Hello everyone. This video is going to cover uh, a lecture on the poem Dream of the Rood. Uh, the author of Dream of the Rood is not known. It was uh, found, this poem was found in a 10th century manuscript of Old English poetry in Italy. So, um, you know, we're talking about all of the British invasions, or the Anglo-Saxons rather, the Anglo-Saxons invading uh, England, and now all of a sudden we have a poem about that time and about those people all the way over in Italy. So it was found in a 10th century manuscript, so we're talking 900s. But some of the text of the poem was also found inscribed on the Ruthwell Cross. Uh, so this is the Ruthwell Cross, this statue, that's the Ruthwell Cross. And those carvings on this cross date back to the early 8th century, so the early 700s. So even though we found the poem in a manuscript dating back to 900, we've seen pieces of the poem as far back as the early 700s. Uh, this is a closer vision of the Ruthwell Cross. Um, so you see these inscriptions along the side here. All of those words, that's Old English, so it's really hard you know, for us to translate. But these are the inscriptions where we see pieces of this poem. So there they are on the Ruthwell Cross. So let's talk about the dream of the rood. So rood is another word for cross. Um, so when we talk about the dream of the rood, we're talking about the dream of uh, a man had a dream about the cross that Jesus was crucified on. So let's split up the poem into three sections. The first section, uh, the dreamer is speaking. The dreamer who has the dream about the cross is dreaming. Uh, the dreamer describes the cross in his dream, uh, shifting from this beautiful, bejeweled, awesome thing to this ugly, um, terrible, bloody torture device. So we go back and forth and we see this um, dichotomy, I guess, between good and bad. And then the second section uh, is the largest section of the poem, and that is where the cross speaks to the dreamer. Uh, toward the end of this section, he commands that the dreamer tell his story, tell the story of the cross from the cross's point of view to everyone that he can. Uh, and then, you know, we have the third section where we're back to the dreamer and the dreamer has changed. You know, this dream has changed him forever. Uh, he looks forward to going to heaven more than he ever has before. Uh, and he is a changed man, very much like Cademan is a changed man after he has his dream and is able to sing. So a couple of questions that we need to really think about uh, for Dream of the Rude. One is, what is personification? So if you remember correctly, personification is when something that is not a person acts like a person. So if the cross is speaking, then that is personification because crosses don't speak, people do. So do you think that the cross becomes a character in the poem? Well, of course it becomes a character in the poem. That's why it's speaking to us. But why is it important that the cross takes on these qualities in the poem? Uh, one reason could be that the, this poem gives us a point of view about a story in the Bible that we have never had before. Uh, you know, if we read in the Bible about the crucifixion um, of Jesus, then we know that, you know, he was nailed to the cross and he was crucified according to the Bible story, but we don't have really a point of view other than how the apostles witnessed what happened. Uh, so this poem kind of gives us an alternate point of view of that story. A couple of literary features that we find in this poem, uh, we have alliteration here as well, just like we did in Cademan's Hymn. Uh, we have fairly fashion, splendid sight, uh, changing clothes, colors, gemstones gleamed, tree, triumphant, tarnished. 
Uh, if you'll notice, in a lot of Old English or Anglo-Saxon poetry, uh, many of the sections are alliterative, which means many of the sections uh, are almost assigned a letter, and all of the words in that small section have that same letter. Uh, and this is on purpose. Anglo-Saxon poetry, Anglo-Saxon stories are kind of an oral uh, storytelling. So, you know, they didn't write a lot of it down, and people would travel from city to city, and they would tell stories, and it was easier to remember all of the parts of a story if alliteration was involved. It was easier to remember all of the things when you had alliteration there. So that's one of the reasons why alliteration is so profound in a lot of Anglo-Saxon poetry. Uh, we also see compounded epithets in this poem. So again, that's that double name. So we have glory's trunk. So that's just another way to say tree. Uh, and then we have almighty ruler and eternal king. So uh, those are representative of Jesus or God. Um, we will talk later on about the importance, uh, the distinguish between a ruler and a king and why those two things are used in different ways in some of the Anglo-Saxon poetry. And we also have uh, the kenning. So the kenning is the two words that mean something different. So language bearers uh, is another word for people. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Anglo-Saxon values versus Christian values. So, you know, Anglo-Saxons were not Christian. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons valued battle and warriors and you know, bloodshed and loyalty. Um, they did not believe in many Christian values. Uh, one thing that was very defined for Anglo-Saxon uh, society was this uh, relationship, this idea about the comitatus. So comitatus is a relationship between a lord and his thane. Uh, and a thane is like a servant, kind of. Um, so the lord would be like the owner of the house, and then a thane would be someone who works in that owner's house. Uh, and this relationship is very important to the Anglo-Saxons. So the lord, his job is to protect his thanes and provide for them. And um, in exchange, those thanes are supposed to protect the lord. So if something were to happen, if there is an attack on a, a lord's house and the lord dies, but a thane lives, then in the Anglo-Saxon culture, that thane would live a life of shame because he is, the thane is supposed to protect the lord at all costs. So if the lord dies, the thane should have died first. So when you think about this poem, who is the Lord and who is the Thane? Uh, something interesting about this particular poem is that uh, the Thanes in the poem are referred to as the apostles, as Jesus' apostles. Um, and as we know in this story, the apostles do not protect their Lord. Uh, Jesus does die. Uh, but kind of one of the points of this poem is, is to try to change this comitatus way of thinking in the Anglo-Saxon society to a more Christian version. Uh, so, you know, in Anglo-Saxon households, if the thanes or the apostles die, or do not die, but their Lord does, then they should be shameful. But in Dream of the Rude, we have this idea that the apostles do not protect their Lord, and their Lord dies, but the Lord saves them from their sins. So we've got that resurrection kind of idea. Um, we've got that he died to save, you know, Christians all across the world. Uh, it's important to note that Christian values are quite the opposite of Anglo-Saxon values. You know, Anglo-Saxons love battle and warriors and bloodshed and loyalty. And Christian values are um, heavy with nonviolence. Uh, leaders lead by serving, not, uh, they don't have this quid pro quo kind of attitude where if, if a Lord gives a thane something, the thane has to give something in return. Uh, they're very different, so to speak. 
So what I want you to uh, kind of notice is that some of the language in Dream of the Rude paints Jesus as more of a warrior kind of entity. Uh, the the poem describes uh, Jesus as he climbs up the tree uh, instead of the tree, instead of being placed on the tree. He climbs up the tree. Um, they call him the Lord of mankind and the Savior, uh, which gives off these a very much warrior-like feel. Um, so, you know, if we're trying to convert a bunch of Anglo-Saxons to Christianity, then we need to make Christianity attainable for the Anglo-Saxons. So the Dream of the Rood kind of acts as a bridge between Anglo-Saxon values and Christian values so that Anglo-Saxon people could relate to Christianity because if they can't relate to Christianity, then they absolutely won't convert to Christianity. So, you know, if, if Jesus in the Dream of the Rood kind of acts a little bit like an Anglo-Saxon Anglo warrior, then Anglo-Saxons can appreciate Jesus and his value to uh, the Christian world. Um, in this conversion between Anglo-Saxons and um, from Anglo-Saxon values to Christian values, uh, many mercenary or missionaries, I'm sorry, many missionaries would teach Anglo-Saxons about the Old Testament. So think about the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament in the Bible is where, you know, most of the wars happen. That, that's where all the bad stuff really happens is in that Old Testament. Uh, it's much more gory. Um, you know, a lot of battle type situations are happening in the Old Testament. Well, missionaries would teach Anglo-Saxon groups the Old Testament first, again, because that is how they connected to Christianity. Uh, so, we have in the Dream of the Rood uh, some questions that I want you to think about uh, because, you know, you may see these questions again on a midterm somewhere. Uh, but do you think the poem is more Anglo-Saxon or more Christian? Uh, what evidence do you think you could pull from the poem to support that this is more Anglo-Saxon or this is more of a Christian ideology? Um, what evidence of the Comitatus tradition do you see? How is there a Lord Thane relationship uh, being shown in this poem? And like I said about the Old Testament, you know, in the early years of converting the Germanic people to Christianity, there was a lot of emphasis on introducing the Anglo-Saxons to the Old Testament before discussing ideas of the New Testament. Uh, before we got to love thy neighbor, we we had to you know, talk about David and Goliath and uh, all the different battles that happened in the name of Christianity. So why might that have been effective? Uh, what religious value might a poem like this have on Christianity? And why is it effective? Why do you think that this poem could have been used as an effective tool to convert uh, those Germanic people to Christianity? Uh, a couple of lines that I want you to really read closely and make sure you understand uh, lines 33 and 34 and lines 39 through 42 um, are some pretty good examples about how Jesus is described in more of a warrior-like way instead of a non-violent uh, like leader. So pay attention to those lines. And then I also want you to really pay attention to lines 65 through 80. Those lines uh, really set forth a precedent for the comitatus relationship. It really exemplifies what the comitatus relationship looks like uh, and should help you answer any questions about the comitatus tradition uh, if you were to see questions like that on a midterm exam. Uh, that is it for this week. If you have any questions at all, please email me and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks.